This is Mrs. Alexander, and this is your Unit 5.1 through 5.12 Front Load PowerPoint. All right, let's get back to Anna. So we've kind of been talking about all her symptoms and conditions, but we haven't really gotten back to Anna lately. So remember, when she was alive, she had quite a few things going wrong with her. She died pretty young at the age of 38. Uh, some of the things she had was type 1 diabetes, diagnosed when she was a juvenile, sickle cell anemia, high blood pressure, her heart was enlarged, and she had a family history of high cholesterol because of that FH mutation. We just learned that she had a pacemaker and a stent as well in her coronary artery. So now what? What else can Anna have? Well, looks like based off of her medical um, records and medical history you're going to get, she also has some sort of infection that she caught while she was at the hospital. The medical history says that she was at the hospital for 10 days and during that time she contracted some sort of infection. We're going to learn what kind of infection it was by looking at the different bacteria that it could be. So let's talk about how people are infected through a population. Whenever an infection occurs, this is whenever some sort of pathogen invades and begins growing inside of a host. The pathogen is the disease or the bacteria or virus and the host is whoever it's infecting. That could be a person or an animal. It's called a disease once that infection has gone to the point that it's invading the growth and impairing the growth of that person and it causes something to go wrong. So some of their bodily functions, their brain waves, they're growing and repairing of cells. It could cause some sort of sickness or illness. That's when we call it a disease. So the pathogens have to enter the body, get into our cells, invade and colonize, meaning they have to grow more of themselves. And then some sort of damage has to occur to the body or the tissues. Typically, this occurs through the openings of our body, such as our eyes, our mouth, our nose, genitals, and also if we have a scratch or a break in our skin. So some sort of contact has to occur. Um, in most cases, but we're going to talk about some other ways that we can get infected as well. They're easily in transmitted. We call them contagious. So if something can go from a person to a person, that's called contagious. Another big fancy word for contagious is communicable. Think of the word communicate. It's kind of like how bacteria and viruses can communicate to one another to say, hey, let's infect and invade this host right here. The agents are the, the things that are very likely to cause a disease once they've become contagious are called virulent. Think of the word virus or virulent. So virulent means that they can cause disease. Contagious means that they are just easily transmitted. Something can be contagious but not virulent. The most wor troublesome infections are the ones that are contagious and virulent. So the common cold, that's not a really big harmful thing. It doesn't kill a lot of people your age group, but it's really contagious. Whereas something like HIV virus, it's very virulent. It causes a lot of different diseases, but it's hard to catch as long as you keep yourself, you know, safe whenever it comes to certain practices and away from blood that may contain it. Patient zero is an activity we're going to do where we're going to talk about how the very first person to contract or to become contagious to catch something in a population, they're called patient zero. And so please know that patient zero is the first person, the person that's the cause of the infection. This brings us to infectious disease agents. There's six types you're going to need to know for the test. And then, of course, bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoa, helminthes, and prions. You're going to need to know how they're transmitted and what type of infections they can cause. So let's briefly go over them and come back to it at the end of this presentation. Bacteria and viruses are the most common. We're going to demonstrate the differences between bacteria and viruses in just a little bit, but you need to know that, that a bacteria is a single-celled organism. We classify that as a prokaryote, and they can survive on their own. However, viruses cannot survive on their own. They have to be inside something, inside a host, in order to reproduce. Both of these things can be easily spread through contact with contaminated persons, or from person to person, and through the air. Fungus. Fungus, you probably think of like mushrooms as a fungus. Well, that's a good example. However, um, fungi, plural for fungus, fungi can cause infections as well. Not just eating like morel mushrooms or things like that, but whenever a fungus is airborne and you can get it into your lungs, you can get some sort of infection. Or if you touch it, it can grow on your skin and create a fungal infection. And it also can get in your body. Fungus, they need a warm, damp area. 
and it can spread through the spores that get in the air or just by touching the fungus or whatever is warm and damp. Or if you share someone's clothes that haven't been washed or they're warm and they're damp, you can get a fungus from somebody else's clothes. Protozoa. Protozoa are spread whenever you eat food or eat something that has the protozoa in it. The eggs, um, for example, dried up um, feces sometimes contains proto protozoa or also whenever you drink contaminated water like go to the lake and go swimming and drink water, it can have protozoa in there. Protozoa can also live inside of another host, like a mosquito. Mosquitoes are fine with having malaria inside of them. They're not sick, but as soon as that mosquito bites you, you get the protozoa malaria. Malaria turns into a disease. Helminthes is another word for worms. There's helminthes and platyhelminthes, round worms and flat worms. Worms are basically contracted whenever somehow the egg gets into your mouth, and that egg can be in dried up feces or fecal matter. It can be in meat that is undercooked or hasn't been cooked, um, and it can transfer from person to person as well. If one person has the worms in their body and you have contact with that person, you can get it as well. Prions are probably the hardest and most rare to catch. Prions um, is whenever you have some sort of protein that becomes mutated, this can happen randomly in people that have a genetic disorder or disease that's carried on in families. A lot of times people don't even know that they have it until it happens. Or in rare chances, you can actually get um, eat brain or spinal tissue um, that's not cooked. Don't know why you would do that, but if you did, you can ingest or eat prions. That would be basically um, all those horror zombie movies you've probably seen where they eat the brains of uh, the dead people and then they become b zombies. In theory, that's how I like to think about prions. It's basically mm, when you eat brains that have mutated proteins in them. So how are people infected? Body fluids, mucus from a cough, a sneeze, your snot, blood. Anytime blood gets into your system through your mouth, your eyes, or a scratch. So if somebody's bleeding and that blood's worse into your eye and they have an infection, you can get it or through fecal matter. You know, that's like poop. So contact with air, water, food is also another way. So eating um, food or water that's contaminated or breathing in air. Certain viruses and bacteria can float around in the air for certain periods of time. Um, so you need to be careful when someone's coughing. Cover your cough. Contacted. If you contact some sort of contaminated surface, like doorknobs, telephones, pick up a telephone, you use that telephone, somebody right before you had just coughed into it, or the doorknob, that's why we're always on to students to wash their hands frequently. So person to person, some examples of those kind of spread of diseases are colds, flu, smallpox, polio. You, your animal can have a disease and it can give it to humans, like rabies, brucellosis, cat scratch fever. Um, contact, we went over those. Toilet seat, yeah, it's kind of gross, but some, you know, bacteria you can get from sitting on a toilet seat. Um, I mean, you would really have to try hard to get that bacteria where it doesn't belong. But, you know, the best thing to do is, I know sometimes we put paper down, sit on it, that kind of thing. Make sure that you're eating and drinking food that has been cleaned or boiled or used a UV light to kill any kind of contamination. Cook meat always to the point in which it asks you to, and clean off surfaces that have come into contact with contaminated raw food. So don't cut your chicken, then go to cook it, and then use the same cutting board to cut your vegetables that you're going to eat raw. It's kind of common sense. And then vectors usually have to get into your system by getting bitten by something like a mosquito, flea, or a tick. Long-term effects of infections. Bacterial and viral can damage your heart tissue. That kind of is how it relates to the last activity. Um, when we get into Ana Garcia, we're going to learn about something called a urinary tract infection, which is very common after being um, in the hospital. We'll learn about what bacteria is responsible for that and how just a simple bacterial infection can cause all of your other symptoms and diseases to worsen and actually can kill you. For activity 512, you're going to need to be able to classify the different types of infectious agents. So we're going to go over them real quick. Bacteria is one type. It's a cellular organism. It actually is able to be treated with antibiotics and medicines if you come down with one. The modes of transmission are sneezing, coughing person to person, sexual or blood contact, and also surface contact like doorknobs. It does not need or require a host for reproduction. Some examples are tuberculosis, traveling through the air by cough, E. coli, which is found in different meats that are uncooked like chicken, strep throat is actually a staphylococcus or a streptococcal infection, 
that can grow inside the throat. And syphilis is usually a sexually transmitted disease that causes these little bumps everywhere, including the genital region. Fungus is another cellular organism. Cellular meaning it's an animal. It actually has cells and it actually eats things to grow and survive. Just like mushrooms grow on dead decaying bark to grow, some kind of fungus can actually grow on our skin and eat our skin. They are transmitted airborne when you breathe in the fungus spores, also whenever you touch the fungus. This could be touching another person's fungus, it could be touching something that has the fungus on it, like a wet, damp cloth or disgusting, uncleaned wrestling mat. Um, here are some examples. Athlete foot ringworm, which is actually not a worm, it's actually just a fungus infection that shows up like a, worm, like a ring pattern. Um, and it actually itches really, really bad, just like athlete's foot does. And then histoplasmosis is an airborne fungus that you can get into your lungs and can cause a rash. These are treated with antifungal medications, and they do not require a host to reproduce. They can live outside the body on their own. Next is protozoa. Protozoa are microscopic parasites, like Giardia, Malaria, and Cystosporidium. They usually live in contaminated food, meat, water, feces, and they can be transported, uh, transferred from person to person or from animal to human when they're bitten or when you ingest that feces or uncooked meat from that animal. They are killed using antiprotozoan medications and drugs. They do need a host to survive, so they need to be living inside of something. For example, we talked about malaria with sickle cell. Malaria is a disease caused by either a virus or by the protozoa that lives inside the Ensopheles mosquito. So on the EOC, I think they classify the malaria as the protozoa instead of as a virus. It's kind of misleading, but I understand. Um, both Giardia and Cryptosporodium create massive diarrhea when you drink contaminated water and food. Helminthes is a classification of a parasitic worm, and these worms can be round or flat, and they are ingested whenever you come into contact with the eggs or larva of the worm through feces, eating uncooked meat, animals, um, or person contact as well. So drinking after someone that has them in their digestive system. They must use a host to live, so they have to be in your body um, growing and reproducing. In order to get them out, usually an antiparasitic medication is required. A little tidbit of information, if you look at that bottom picture, that's a guy actually pulling a worm out of someone's foot, wrapping it around a little stick. That's where our first symbol for the medical doctor comes from, located in the top left-hand corner. This was the first treatment that they try to use to pull worms out of people's bodies and digestive systems because they can go all around the whole body, the brain, the eye, the rectum, all sorts of places. Not a good infection to have. Prions are very rare, but they can happen. It's whenever the brain or proteins in the brain have become deteriorated. Um, this can happen if you inherit it, like Kreutzfeldt jacobs disease, it causes your brain to shrink and you to go crazy. It also happens in animals like cows, and so if you eat, cooked, uh, eat meat that's uncooked from a cow that has the disease, you can ingest those prions. So don't eat uncooked brain or spinal fluid or spinal tissue from any kind of animal. Always cook your meat and avoid those that may be acting more difficult or weird. Um, there is no treatment for a prion disorder, so it's a kind of a bad one to get. Last but not least, this brings us to our viruses. Viruses and bacteria are the most common. Uh, in this case, viruses are not cellular. They don't have a cell. They don't have, they don't have cells. They don't have a nucleus. They still have DNA, but it's not in its general location. Some of the common viruses are the common cold, influenza, and HIV. Rotavirus is also common, and that's um, common in little kids as well, and that can actually kill them because they can have stomach and food diarrhea so bad. Um, and so virus is what you need to know is they are airborne, sneezing, coughing, person to person through sexual or blood contact, surface, surface contact, uh, like the doorknob, pretty much the same way bacteria. Um, however, they do need a host to reproduce, so they have to grow and live inside someone. And the only treatment is rest and hydration. There's not a cure for viruses. Once you have a virus, it'll always be in your cells. Your body remembers it with your antigens and antibodies. So what happens if you do get one of these diseases? Well, hopefully it's rare because our body has natural lines of defense to protect us against. There's non-specific and specific. Things like skin, mucus, nose hair, and tears, they're trying to keep things out of our body so that they don't actually infect us. And then there's the second defense or second line. Once they get in, our body will cause a fever and inflammation and our phagocytes and proteins will go in and actually try to kill those. If we already have the virus and our body has remembered it, 
then we'll use things like T cells and B cells in order to fight off those. And we'll go more into depth in activity 516.